Welcome to the last set of notes you're going to take on this unit. This is the smart consumer notes. That's what you should have in the title section of your notes page. And then down here is the first thing that should go in step two, where you're actually taking the notes. We're talking about good consumer choices. And it's a very challenging thing because money and time are both scarce resources. So you have to make do with what you have and try and compete against these large companies that are trying to sell you stuff. Because prices vary widely and because advertising is primarily there to persuade you to buy a product and not really to inform you, uh, you're having to pick through all these overwhelming numbers of options to find the stuff that actually makes sense for you and the stuff you need and not just stuff you might want temporarily. Because competition is driving the exchange of goods and services, that means that there are lots and lots and lots of companies offering lots and lots of different options for most consumer goods and services. That isn't true in certain areas, and in those areas you're out of luck, like say, who to get your internet from. So here's what you should do. You should use a decision-making chart to comparison shop for big purchases. The smaller the purchase, like the cheaper it is, or the shorter amount of time that it takes, it becomes less and less important to do really elaborate systems like that, but it can still help you if you're uh, agonizing about your choice. You should absolutely read consumer reviews on reliable websites, which we'll talk more about later. Um, you should read the fine print, which I've made very large because I think I, I like irony like that. You should look at product insurance, warranties, and all the other optional add-ons because sometimes they don't even tell you that those are like opt out. You have to tell them to not get you those. You want to be aware that every piece of advertising that you look at, though it may seem like it's just uh, telling you what's in this product, is actually trying to trick you. Not because they're bad, but because they're trying to make money, and that's how the economy works. So you want to try and find advice from people who know how to buy this kind of thing effectively, like financial advisors, books, good internet sources, because you may not even be aware of all of the fine print things or all of the sneaky ins and outs of the advertising. And the more you can get help from other people, the better off you'll be. Let's talk about those key vocab words from the previous slides. Warranties. Um, this is when you purchase, particularly some large purchases that would be very expensive if they uh, broke down all of a sudden. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to hedge your bets. So if you uh, have that product break down on you, then the person who sold it to you promises that they will pay to fix it or pay to get you a new one. Um, a warranty is a promise that they will fix or pay for a new version of a large product that you've purchased from them. By large, I mean expensive. Um, this is only sometimes worth it. Sometimes the warranties themselves are very expensive even compared to the common kinds of repairs. And so you wanna read the fine print really carefully because sometimes it doesn't even cover the kinds of repairs you would expect it to. You wanna read other people's advice online and particularly look at customer reviews for whether or not you need a warranty. Uh, product insurance is a similar thing. Uh, you'll find this mostly on like cell phones. This is gonna be a good example of this. And for the most part, you do not need product insurance. Um, you get very reasonable product insurance automatically when you purchase with a credit card. It's really more of a warranty, but basically say you're purchasing a cell phone and you're worried you're gonna break or drop it that insurance might not even cover that. So you wanna look at the fine print and look at how much it's gonna cost you. Because if replacing your phone costs $200 and you're paying in a year $250 worth of insurance payments, that's not worth it. You're just handing extra money to that company for no reason. Here are the things you wanna avoid when you are out to purchase goods and services. Avoid addictive things, like chemically addictive things like tobacco, but also your brain is just a big bag of chemicals and gambling sure does release a lot of nice feeling ones but then it'll get you hooked and then your life is ruined. Um, but also there's social benefits to things like clothes. And uh, you can see that when companies try and put out ads that put a lot of pressure on you to buy what they have, or your friends tell you that the really cool stuff is coming out, you should definitely go buy those things. It may give you temporary feelings of well-being or make you feel like you're part of a group, but unless that is the most important thing to you and it's worth the way huge amounts of money you're gonna pay for it, it's not necessarily worth your time. You definitely wanna avoid really sketchy looking online websites in terms of advice and purchasing, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, layaway plans and extended warranties are almost all of them ways to just take extra money away from you that you could get around if you just have emergency funds and you've saved up money. Uh, if you accept personal checks for big things you sell, like your car, um, then they could just bounce. This is one of those key dangers. If you're ever selling your car, 
don't accept just a personal check from somebody else because they could just write whatever they want on that thing and their bank would be like, hey, that's bounced. Oh, and then that person's disappeared and now you have no money. So also, you might not want to trust people who are accepting personal checks for things like a car. And you also want to not just choose the cheapest option because they're often going to break sooner and so you end up having to spend more in the long run or they're just unpleasant to have. Okay, let's talk about source reliability because you're going to be doing some research for uh, a consumer product that you want to buy. So you want to consider each of these uh, questions as you go along. So you want to say, who manages the site? Particularly looking in that about section because sometimes they're involved in that product or industry that they're trying to sell you. And that means that they have a conflict of interest because if they're trying to make the money off of you buying this thing and they're the ones telling you to buy it, that's just advertising. That's not advice. Uh, you want to look at what the purpose of the website is. If it's for advice, then that's one thing. Or if the purpose is to provide an advertising platform or a chance for companies to pay people to review them, that's a bad idea. If you look at the person who wrote it, um, do they have any interest in that company? Do they own stocks? This might be harder to find, but uh, that kind of insider work like that is very common. And so you want to be suspicious until you find that someone is trustworthy, like they belong to a reviewing website that makes their money, say, from viewer donations or something where they're picked outside of the financial system that they are reviewing. You also want to look at if it's very recent, because as you might have noticed, our economy is just flailing from place to place, and particularly in the healthcare system is uh, getting pulled around all the time. So recent advice is good. Um, you want to look to see if the author is citing sources or providing evidence that they actually have a background in the topic or with this particular product. Um, Amazon does verified reviewers, and there are certainly problems with that system, but it, it, it is more uh, reliable than, say, just a rando website out there on the internets. Uh, but you also want to look at how does the source that you are looking at compare to other sources who have done the same thing, uh, because that's called corroboration in history, for example. But you want to look at corroborating this review of a product to make sure that you really believe um, the average stars say it gets at Amazon. So here is what you're going to see on the next page of that PowerPoint where you're working on a smart consumer research project. And so you're going to be using all of these notes that you've just taken to complete that project successfully and show that you can be a smart consumer. Good luck.